It's my pleasure to introduce our wrap-up keynote today. Uh, our keynote comes to us from uh, Oxford and Southampton in England. That's where the history comes from. Over there in the other side of the, of the pond. I've known David uh, now for almost uh, 10 years, Professor David DeRoar. Uh, we have an overlapping interest in music information for people things. Uh, David is a computer scientist of long, long famous standing. He's also an avid musician. He plays a main jazz bass. Uh, did you bring the bass? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And he's also a frequenter of really interesting and groovy music festivals. So he just came from Glastonbury. And people know Glastonbury, he had uh, drinks with the with um, the Rolling Stones. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so he has a long history in a wide area of computer science and digital humanities. Um, He's worked in the music realm, he works in the, in the linked open data realm, the semantic grid, um, ontologies, all these varied aspects of, 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 on the information side of, of computing science. Uh, social science data has been another area in which he's been working uh, in the UK. Uh, he's recently to Oxford, it's been two years now, three, three years now, three years at Oxford now, after a long history at the University of Southampton. Um, and the computer science department down there. He's now a professor at Oxford and the director of the Oxford E Research Center. So that's sort of where he, his intellectual home, um, and he's, he's a great, doing a great job at the Oxford E Research Center. And today, as part of his, his work there and the team that he's built up at, at Oxford, he's going to be giving a talk on the social machines of science and scholarship, which brings together pretty much all the varied threads of his career into this um, uh, into this uh, large scale project that's uh, that's going on with him and his fellow colleagues in, in Europe. So without any further ado, a big round of applause for our final keynote. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. I was last at JCDL in 2009 and before that uh, in 98. I thought it was just, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be back, and also I look forward to seeing people in the double jointed conference in London next week. <laughs> <laughs> there are four parts to this, uh, this talk, all about the same length. Um, first, it's slightly controversially called the end of the article. I, I didn't use that phrase, but it's a phrase that's been associated with me, thanks to Twitter or something. Um, and it, it, this isn't grammatical. It, it, this is about uh, scholarly communications. Um, uh, and if I sound sort of down on, on the papers, um, I then I hopefully um, recover myself later on by, by telling you what's good about papers as well. Um, but really, I'm um, talking about the fitness and purpose of scholarly communication as we practice it today, and I'll ask whether our research practices are so different that maybe we should be communicating differently. So we have a look at how digital research is done today. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about two social things, social objects, and then finally social machines, which I should just suggest to you that it's something you're all doing anyway, but perhaps didn't have a name for it before, or had a different name for it. Um, and it, this isn't going to be so much about how our social machines can help you, but also about you guys actually uh, helping social machines. That, that's where we'll go at the end. So I'll start with, a, with an anecdote. Um, partly, I know that the, the changes in scholarly communications have to be incremental. Um, yeah, it, it, it'll be slow. It's a, um, I don't want to be technology deterministic and say, oh, we're going to put all this technology is here. We should change the way we do things. I, I want things to, to co evolve. And then on the other hand, I occasionally get provoked. So I, I just want things to happen faster. And, and that happened recently. So there was a wonderful conference in Amsterdam called Beyond the PDF2. Possibly two or three of you were there. And it was actually a really nice event. It had a bit of an unconference format. It was a bit like a wedding reception. Lots of people I know from different communities were meeting each other. It was lovely. Um, mm -hmm. and that was all, those were all the positive things, I would say first. <laughs> and, um, something happened, which is that when, when you register for the conference, you have the opportunity to say in 100 words what your vision is for the future of scholarly communication. And I did that. And I had an email later on saying, you know, thank you for your vision. We haven't accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to give a poster? <laughs> and, and 
Um, actually, in some ways, yes. I really like the poster format. And, and, and it's a different legacy, it's a different way of interaction. But on the other hand, beyond the PDF, to a poster. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I also had a logistical challenge, which is I was coming in from Hong Kong, actually, uh, and to carry the poster was going to be challenging. So I came up with a solution, which was to uh, ask a colleague in Amsterdam to print out an entire printer. Um, this, <laughs> this thing on the right, uh, which is a, sort of like six pages of A4, uh, which became my poster. And, and what that is, is a thought experiment where I put myself uh, slightly into the future, so the year 2065, or possibly the year 2066, we can debate that. Um, and I write a paper about the history of the paper. It's like I, I'm a student on a narrative class, so I'm assuming we still have narrative. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, my, my, my homework is to start history of the paper in the style of this retro thing, the paper. And, and I did this, and I did this quite quickly. Um, and it had interesting results. So, so part of it involved uh, a list, I'll show you in a minute, of the eight reasons for the demise of the paper. Um, various people saw this, and some people saw this online. But by the end of that week, I was invited by Oxford University Press to give a, a talk to their journal editors on the end of the article. Um, and actually, the first slides I can show you today are that talk. So I didn't really think very, very hard about any of this. I was doing it quite quickly, and I was slightly provoked. And I haven't changed the message. I haven't thought harder about it. Just, but I'll show you what I did. Because I think uh, it's, it's interesting in a couple of ways. And the overall topic of discussion here, really, is the, and, and, and the date, is, is this philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, 1665-1666. No, that's why it could be 2065 or 2066. For some, um, some, some Brits in the audience, uh, you may remember a book called 1066 and all that. So I tend to use the 1666 date, so I have talks called 2066 and all that. That's a that's a, that's a talk. The thing is about this, 50 years already, and we're still using this thing, and, and, and you know, there was, there was uh, an amazing moment when, when the Royal Society introduced this. And, uh, we didn't use the word then, we use it now. Really, it was open science. It was the idea that scientists would share what they're doing, so they could stand on each other's shoulders. Um, it's not the first time a scientist has been down. There were communications before, there were patents before. Uh, and then you fast forward to, to now, and, and it looks like this. And it's kind of similar. Um, that's, this is a paper, actually. Yeah. Oh, look, Stephen Down is older. Yeah. Um, and um, it's kind of, isn't that weird? So, 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 the web, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, and that was about changing the way that science information was disseminated. The world has changed, but not the way science information is disseminated. So this is the kind of, oh, you know, is, 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 is this still fit for purpose? On the other hand, 350 years, and we're still using them, they must be doing something right. And it's that tension that I want to play out in this talk. So these are my eight reasons for the demise of the paper in 2013. I'm going to run through these. Um, I actually, it's in 2020 when I wrote this, in the very, very informal peer review that, that, that I conducted uh, on my uh, poster, people maybe change it to 2030. People who I was being too pessimistic or optimistic. So I'm going to run through these eight things uh, quite quickly. And this is all written up as a, uh, the actual article is available on my blog if people want to, to read it further. So the first thing, the first reason for the demise of, of the article. Still impossible to include the evidence in the paper, or to contain a failure. Now, the reason I was prompted to, to talk about this was that I'd been on a panel uh, at a meeting about future publishing, um, and someone else has said, what we should be doing is put data in PDFs. And I'm thinking, I'm analyzing Twitter. I'm really, I'm really not going to put the whole of Twitter you know, pipe into, into this PDF. So that's why I contain a failure. Um, so this is a sense in which the research that we're doing that doesn't like, fit in the in, in the, the size of the knowledge unit, which is which is a paper. This one's quite uh, it's related, but but there's some interesting issues hidden in here. Um, and this takes us into the, the reproducibility um, space. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that. In fact, Carol gave a on that here last year. Um, and I'll talk some more about this picture later on. This is a microsquare pack, which will feature when I come onto social objects. Um, but really, uh, the way we're doing research, the way we're doing science, means you can't actually do that reconstruction, reproduce piece based just on the things that we used to use um, to, to do that. And in the uh, poster, 
I refer to this as the crisis of reproducibility. And have people thought that the crisis of reproducibility that I was referring to was that we're not doing it or something? Um, it isn't. The crisis of reproducibility I'm referring to is that I think people are confused about what reproducibility is. So in this wonderful open science movement, which I'm very supportive, um, a very important thing is happening. As we, as we conduct research that's increasingly computational, we're publishing the data and the results and the software. And we're really making it as easy as possible people to reconstruct those experiments and to repurpose those experiments. And that's exactly right and important. And I don't think it's necessarily what we should call reproducibility. Reproducibility is when it's you independently recreate something. So you have to have something different, otherwise it's just a reconstruction. If I do an experiment and I, I get a result, and I'm really very excited because this is the result I was looking for, I don't really know whether that's a real result or whether it's some sort of accident of my experimental apparatus or my software or the position of the moon or something. I really want someone else to run this experiment in different circumstances and see if they get the same result. I don't want them to run it in identical circumstances. That's not useful to me. Okay. That's my crisis of reproducibility. If you listen to the reproducible research movement, they're saying it's all about portability of, of, of the science. And that is important, but it isn't reproducibility. Round over. <laughs> um, the way we do science, the way we do research, and the challenges that we're addressing don't necessarily fit into the sort of historical categories and disciplinary boundaries. Why should, why should they? I mean, we've ended up for all sorts of reasons with the disciplines that we have. Um, but yeah, if research is being done differently and, and there are different research questions and different ways of doing things, then, then maybe those boundaries are, are wrong or in the way. Uh, this is the list of UK grand challenge areas, which, as you can see, cut across all the traditional research disciplines. Um, what's happening with publication of papers is we're encouraged to become more and more specialist in smaller and smaller areas. Um, and it doesn't necessarily encourage the multidisciplinary reuse. Um, so the notion of a, of, of a shared object which can, has a commonly interpretable core um, that can be used by lots of different disciplines is, uh, I think, very important. Here. These are nice pictures from a colleague Ian Buckle in, in, in Manchester. It captures attention, which I'll, I'll come back to later. The one on the left is the big data and the big data center. The one on the right is the sense-making network of, of humans and computers and the things that we're sharing, which may be papers and data and models and all sorts of things. Um, and I think what we're doing in research is, is probably you know, a mixture of both of these things. But it, it, increasingly, some of that computer use, some of that automation, which is one of the big things today, uh, is, is part of the story. As, as you know, lots of people are interested in, in mining the, uh, the, the, the scientific literature. Uh, but increasingly, uh, we're, we're writing papers for, for if you like, machines to read as well as, as well as people. So there's, uh, there's that whole automation piece, which I'll say a lot more about. The fact that we have to somehow fit the, uh, the, the team of people who do a piece of research into a list of co-authors and assign some strange semantics to the author uh, is also a legacy of the, of the paper. And really, we need Hollywood-style credits, um, especially when we're working with uh, Examples from citizen science, where we have potentially thousands of, of, of authors on a, on, on a paper describing a new scientific outcome. So I think we need Hollywood style credits, really, on, on, uh, on papers. <laughs> so these are, um, these are fairly accurate. There's, there's another mention of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this one generates more discussion potentially, but, and it's come up in discussions this week already. Um, through open access, through, through green policies that we're certainly seeing in, in universities in the UK. Um, at some point, you, know, you run out of budget to publish through other means, so aren't the universities going to start uh, pushing out publications much more institutionally? And if that kind of trend continues, we just see this increasing scale of publication. And one criticism of this is that the existing publishing model is filtered and published, this is the shirky thing. Um, uh, and, and that's moving into a model where it's published, and then how do you filter? But I don't think that's quite right, because the existing model is sort of filtered and published, then filtered and published. <laughs> so th th there's more phases to this. But uh, it's, a, it's a question of scale. If, if all that stuff's coming out, what are the new mechanisms within that ecosystem which help us find the right stuff and share that knowledge? It's very interesting this week to see various things going on here that address exactly that problem. Papers aren't the only way we report research. We're required. For clients, we use all sorts of reasons, um, depending on where we work, who we work, who funds us, to report in various ways. So it's not one size fits all. And that's, a, in a sense, the papers that we're publishing are just one 
cut on serialization, if you like, of the knowledge uh, that occurs in a piece of research. And the final point here uh, also played into something I was doing at the Beyond the Media event where we did a role playing panel when I was playing the role of funder. Um, I think it's a research council, data research council. Um, and and it, from a funding viewpoint, if you invest in a project that's generating some data and no one can ever find that, then that was a pointless investment. If they can find it but they can't reuse it, it's probably a pointless investment. If they can find it, use it, and the act of finding it and using it is adding value, so that, so that that data is accruing value, um, then that was a very good investment. And I had an interesting um, experience which sort of motivates this tool. The, um, this guy, <laughs> you've heard of him, he's a chess player. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard him recently. He's, he's talking about innovation, and um, Gary Kasparov's theory about innovation is that innovation has slowed down. But there's nothing that happened since about the Apple IIe microcomputer that you can see happening in the 80s that, that, that is now a mass production state. He's measuring innovation by um, you know, what's gone through to mass production, and he's, he's uh, observing that the wealthy don't have greater access to technology than everyone else, but historically that would have been the case, and therefore innovation has slowed down. Interesting. Hypothesis. He presented that in answer to a bunch of academics, just sort of six or seven of us. Um, and the other academics all responded by saying, No, no, you're wrong. We're innovating all the time. These are the wonderful things we've done. And I said, Well, actually, I do. I do think you have a point. I'm from a funding viewpoint. I, I, I do worry that if our scholarly communication system is somehow fundamentally restrictive, um, then this is an inefficiency in terms of that return on investment. Um, and uh, he was interested. He took notes. And then he said, So what are you doing about it? <laughs> Uh, that was a, a, an interesting moment of reflection for me because I realized that what I was doing about it was going to conferences, writing papers, and using the broken scholarly <laughs> communication system <laughs> to fix the scholarly communication system. So that's something else that's provoked me to, to, to be a little bit more uh, evangelical about the future. So, all for discussion later. Eight possible reasons for the demise of Article C. This is in 2030. So that's kind of anti-paper. Let's, 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 let's address what it is that, uh, that the scholarly communication is, is needing to do today. And then we can come back to that later. This is a picture you may have seen before. Um, uh, Ian Foster and Christine Morgan have used this. And it's really capturing the idea that what was once a, a big data challenge before we use those words in, for example, physics with the Large Hadron Collider is now a challenge that's occurring across all disciplines. We have this wonderful uh, image of a, of, of a deluge of flood of, of, of data. And this has been discussed very well this week in the Big Data panel earlier <coughs> this week, for example. So that is one of the senses in which uh, our research practice is changing. And, and I don't think it is so useful to discuss um, what is the scale, what do we mean by big, and, and all those things. The interesting thing here is that we're needing new methods, we're needing new methodology in order to, um, to, to, to tackle the new research challenges. And, and it isn't just doing old stuff quicker, it's actually answering new questions in new ways. <laughs> that's, the, that's the ambition here. And yesterday, two days ago, no, uh, in the, um, the yeah, yesterday in the keynote <laughs> panel, uh, I showed this talk, this, this talk, I showed this uh, picture of this talk. Um, this is a, a simplified diagram. I've never drawn a more complicated one, but I'm sure there's a more complicated one, uh, which captures really where we are in my opinion, at this point in time. And it's actually quite interesting going for discussion. We can look at different trajectories around this picture, but roughly, the y-axis is Moore's law. It's more machines, more cores, more data, more storage, and that seems to be going on and on and on. The, uh, the, the horizontal axis there is more people. Um, if the top one is big data, then perhaps the bottom one is um, big people. Uh, or, <laughs> that was suggested, or big society, which means something entirely else in the UK. Um, and my observation is that what we've seen in 10 years of e-infrastructure and cyber infrastructure investment has been building infrastructures for the high-end research. Um, this is high performance computing, this is supercomputing. You're seeing people try to drag that arrow over towards the right by getting more people to use it, uh, for example. At the same time as there's been a quite organized investment across, across the planet, um, researchers in every discipline have been working increasingly digitally increasingly online because that's what people do, because we're using the web, because we're using smartphones, because we're swimming in a, in a digital world. Not because someone's written a piece of software for us to use to do our research, it's just we're working digitally. There's a whole online science, online research 
community as well. And it's been a worry for me in the recent years. And these, these two things have become separate. And I spend a lot of my time trying to pull those two arrows together. It's that top right hand corner <coughs> of the future, which uh, uh, I think is a great interest and really is, is, is the space that's being explored in this talk. I think this is where we are. And I think in particular is where this community is. I'm not saying that everything has to be up there. As, as I mentioned in the keynote panel, there are certain things which need to be on the bottom left. Um, I'll be flying back later. I want air traffic control, not to be done by Twitter. So, so that's bottom left, that's fine. Uh, computer science tends to be a bit bottom left, and I'm trying to drag that out of myself. This story. So I refer to this thing as the, the fourth quadrant, and that sort of dotted cross uh, defining the quadrants in a way is the crossroads that I think we were discussing in the keynote panel yesterday. <laughs> and maybe we are roughly in the middle of that. Uh, I think where we should be looking towards the future uh, is into that fourth quadrant. And you can then argue about where it goes from there. So one argument says um, the more machines access keeps going, there's a ceiling on the number of people, and therefore there's an arrow going up. Another one says, oh, we're moving really fast along with more people access, we've got a way to go, that's the interesting space, so you have an arrow going to the right. One way or another, there's an arrow that's going a bit to the right, but probably quite a lot out of um, And it's that increasing scale of automation, uh, and I don't like the word automation because that implies somehow replacement of people. I feel like the word assistance by a computer, which is somehow implying empowerment of people, uh, that, uh, that, that underlies this talk as well. So there's some great examples of this well documented paradigm shift that's occurring. Here's the evidence now, what's the hypothesis, the complementary roles of inductive and hypothesis driven science in question and making. By Doug Hill and Steve Miller. This and many other papers are showing new results that have occurred because people are starting with the data uh, and not starting with the hypothesis, conducting the experiments and then collecting the data. More extreme on the data fundamentalism as axis, we have the famous uh, Chris Anderson Live Magazine article from 2007, which, which observes uh, that you have these new methods, but actually implies that they actually render the traditional methods obsolete. I don't actually agree. I think they're another tool um, alongside the existing methods. And then Microsoft, um, in the memory of Jim Gray, produced this wonderful book called Paradigm uh, about data intensive scientific discovery, which uh, I'm sure many of you may have seen this or you've heard all the Paradigm talks from, from Microsoft. Um, it's great, but it, it, it's funny when you're talking to an audience with uh, arts and humanities scholars with, with, with some areas of social science, where they Question the enumeration. Why is that paradigm on the floor? Starting with the data, isn't that the first paradigm? <laughs> uh, so so I, I, I want to think that's the first paradigm. I do think there is a there is a shift going on. That's yeah, it's getting labeled as big data, but there's a shift in our methodology. As Steve mentioned, I, I work in a multidisciplinary centre, and when I talk to researchers from any discipline, I will make them feel special and unique, of course. However, I may secretly think to myself. I can use shared methods across these different areas. And the broad thing that's happening in a lot of areas is this. We're going from some notion of signal, uh, something in the real world. This, this term is quite ubiquitous. It's, it's used in um, audio signal that might be in health informatics, it might be in climate, where there's a signal. Um, and then we're going through some chain of processing using computational tools and using human expertise to some sort of understanding. I think this was an audio signal, as you can tell from the, the understanding. It's occurred in this particular case, and we can spot all sorts of things immediately. Um, but uh, that notion of signal to understanding, or if you like, from data to signal to understanding, um, uh, from noisy data about the real world, real world extracting the signal from that and then interpreting it, does cut across many, many different disciplines. So I want to use that as an example of uh, research practice today. Um, mm -hmm. And sticking to that music example for a second, um, one of the activities we've had in um, with the Modern Library in Oxford. Is a, is a little project called uh, What's the Score at the Volume? It's, a, it's not a good idea to call a project What's the Score, especially when people are, are, are um, you know, if we give a talk during the World Cup or during tennis, uh, <laughs> people Google What's the Score, they don't find the right thing. But uh, this, this, this is interesting in, in, in many ways. This is a digitized uh, music manuscript from the Victorian era. It's um, parlor music, it's like, it's like Victorian pop. Not hugely well studied, actually, by musicologists. Um, we wanted to get this into, um, well, firstly, we wanted electronic catalog records, so we didn't have those. We were also interested in having it in the, in the digital form that we could analyze. Uh, and actually, the music OCR uh, approach, you know, just letting computers do this, 
um, it was really, really quite poor. It's surprisingly poor in some ways. Uh, because if you put this in front of a human being, if it's like a music, they just play it. It's fine. Uh, and so that's what we did. We did a little um, crowdsourcing <coughs> citizen scholarship or something um, where we had, had people um, either just transcribing the metadata on the cover page there or um, actually providing transcriptions of the music. Uh, I think the interesting example of, of a crowdsourcing is it did require some special skills, um, but they're skills that a lot of people have. So, I can come back to this example later, but what we did is, is, is just conduct one, one little uh, experiment. Now, from the musicology viewpoint, the signal people were previously using in the musicology was manuscripts like this, and they're analyzing those. What we can do now, or the, the, the shift, is um, analyze the audio recordings that are being uploaded all the time from, from music performances. So actually, musicologically, that's interesting because you're now analyzing performance. There's some new questions that you can ask and answer. Um, and it's, uh, uh, there's a wonderful project which I mentioned briefly, which involves several people who are in the room, um, called Salami, the best project acronym ever, which is um, <laughs> Structural Analysis of Large Amounts of Music Information. Such a good project um, acronym that all three of me, Stephen, and Hitch, Fujinari, uh, and McGill claim to have invented it. <laughs> I normally at this point say, of course, it was me, but Stephen's in the room, so I'm not going to say that. We're seeing that same sort of methodology applied here. So digital music collections in places like the Internet Archive, people uploading content all the time. Uh, so there's a flow. It's not just a data set. It's, it's, it's not only a flow of, 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 of analyzable material. Um, like with my Watson Skull thing, we, here we, we want students to do human piece here and actually give us a ground truth. The ground truth should be quotes really, because this debate is whether it's ground or truth. But anyway, it's a temporary construction for the purposes of the experimental process that we're using here. Um, and, uh, we did that through student sourcing, if you like, and, and uh, they got paid. They still student sourcing. Um, and then actually, if we just published what the students did in terms of the music analysis, that was a really wonderful resource. It uh, hadn't been done before. This is right the problems with the words, because I'll just say, we haven't done analysis on that scale before. And then music publishers would say, well, which scale is that? It's like, we're, we're just done. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, this wonderful thing on the right, which I want to put in front of us to discuss today because I think this is a fantastic example of a social technical system in our knowledge infrastructure, is this with this thing called Merits, which again Stephen uh, has, has created and runs annually, where the music information retrieval community uh, actually um, come together in a not a competition, <laughs> in, in, in an evaluation exchange, uh, getting their, their algorithms to extract features better than the last year, 0.1% better, right? Really preferably more than that, but always trying to, try to move forward. And what's interesting about this isn't just that exercise, but it's that, that whole process has created an infrastructure, a social technical infrastructure for that process. So for the purposes of analyzing music in the Solari project, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a, a source of a constantly curated and updated um, software which we can use to, to extract information and see if we can actually um, analyze music as, as well as those students did. Now the students were using some tools like this. They were producing um, an analysis, giving us multiple levels of musical structure description. And if anyone's interested in these aspects, I'm sure that uh, Stephen and others can, can go to this in much more detail later. Um, I'm mentioning this because the way we publish this at the end, to capture this, these, these notions of different levels of structure, it's not just repetition, it's, it's higher structure, and also the, the notions of, of the function and the, the different parts there. Um, we published that there's a linked data, and this takes us back to, if you like, to the Royal Society and the Open Science piece, because we're making that data available for people to reuse in various ways and add value to, as I referred to earlier. So in another talk, we talk about the ontology for this. Um, and uh, uh, if anyone wants to know more about uh, uh, an endpoint to access information like this, David Bainbridge is the only person to talk to. So here's the, here's the Mirex piece. This is, uh, a democratic process by which the community choose which features they're going for. Uh, they then use the automation that is in place to run their code against the corpus of music in order to evaluate it. And that process then involves these things called workflows, which I'll also come back to later. Um, this is a workflow. It's a famous workflow in the UC. It's known as Blinky. Um, but the point is, this is a series of processing steps. It's captured as this one defined object, which is a workflow. You can press a button and, and run this thing, or you can take this thing and give it to someone else to run. So it's an interesting digital artifact within our system. And then you end up with the, it's not a competition, evaluation results, 
And just zooming in there, we can see you know, a set of codes that, that, that we would use for structural analysis of music. So today we're not going to talk about the last step of that, which is how, how what those results look like and how we interact with them. And it's a pity in a way we're not talking about that, because that's the visualization piece and the HCI piece, which also needs to be an important part of this, this discussion. I'm going to be a bit more back off as to today. What was going on there is taking data that the community are uploading um, to the web in various ways, in particular the Internet Archive, um, the Internet Archive is, a, is a collection called eTree, which we've, we've separately analyzed and uh, published to the data. And that's another aspect of uh, how research is being done today. So we've just seen a signal to understanding piece, we've seen the construction of social central infrastructures. Um, what we're seeing also is increasing use of data uh, on the web one way or another, and just to tease those apart, sometimes in certain social science, we're using the web as a lens. So the web is a, is a <laughs> co-constituted um, sort of construction of the people and technology. You can use it as a lens to those people who are engaged in that, in that construct. Um, some people study the web as an evolving artifact. This is, this is web science, uh, which is a, um, a, a, an emerging discipline which has now had multiple ACM conferences. One was held at the Paris um, Jamboree, the ACM, uh, ECRC uh, Jamboree in Canada a few months ago, four months ago. And uh, the other aspect of this is that lots of people are doing research data on the web and making it available. This is discussed a lot in places like Research Data Alliance. That's really the web's infrastructure. So we can actually tease apart these different things, but this is something to do with how we're doing research as well, because this is new. Um, we can uh, we, we, we can answer new research questions, we can ask new research questions, we can answer them in, in different ways. So that whole web observatory piece is important, and uh, I'm running a W3C community group on web observatories where we're really just sharing information about different observatories and practice, we're not trying to establish standards at this point, which we need to use it together. Um, and so what we just saw was, a, in, a, in a way, a, a music observatory, but there are many, many, many other observatories. So again, this works across. Final aspect of the way we're doing research today that I want to mention is this, this citizen design piece at scale. Now, Galaxy Zoo, uh, I think most people have heard of, and it involves human beings looking at images of galaxies and figuring out what kind of spiral galaxy they are. On. That was quite successful, and the team who produced that um, uh, now producing every couple of weeks another project off that platform. The platform is called Zooniverse. It's, it's the refactoring of the original Galaxy Zoo. Uh, but well, again, this is a bit like Mirex. Um, people submit ideas for projects. There's a process by which they're selected, and then there's a team. There's 15 people uh, in the Adler Planetarium in Chicago actually doing the development work. There's five in the next building to be announced. Uh, this is fascinating. It's partly humans doing what computers aren't so good at, but probably will be able to be good at another time, instead of waiting to do all the computer science research in order to do that image recognition. They're using humans. Um, and that's a kind of data reduction piece. But that isn't the interesting thing about this. What's really interesting is the new discoveries that are occurring, sometimes from the scientists who are using the data that's coming into this process, but sometimes are resulting from the citizens engaging with the science. Um, not necessarily becoming big scientists, but becoming expert on little pieces of the, uh, the scientific process. So we're seeing very interesting behaviors. And actually, the action is really on the talk forum, the discussion forum associated with the, the, uh, the various universe projects, as well as in that data reduction process. So what's happening is that some, some citizens are waiting to see certain things occurring, and they can apply their expertise to that, they're flagging that to others, the scientists are engaging with them. And this is where the new discoveries are occurring now. Hannes Bull, uh, Greenpeace, various other things that have led to astronomical uh, results, literally, um, <laughs> have occurred um, through that. So if you want to analyze this process, which is something I'm quite interested in doing, uh, it, it, this isn't looking at web models and understanding the data reduction. This is qualitative research, looking at the discourse on the on talk forum. Uh, and that's a, it, what we see there is a kind of machine. We're seeing a set of flows there, like we've seen these workflows before. But again, it's such a technical system. And I think the way I, I at least am doing research at the moment isn't to go into the office, um, set up an experiment, run it, write a paper. I go into the office, I log in, and I look to see how my ongoing experiment is going. As people are uploading more data, the students are annotating more pieces of music. It's really 
This is the, the sort of Merck's example. It's really a flow of, of information uh, around different parts of an ecosystem. And if that's how research is occurring, how is it that you capture that? How do you record that? This, 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 what is the scientific record? So that's the, uh, that seems to be the, the change. Actually, that thing looks a bit like a workflow, but what's different to the workflows I had earlier is they're just single processing steps and things go from place to place to place. This is a flow, this is a circuit, this is live. Um, it's, it's happening all the time, things are going wrong all the time as well. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to this at the end. You can see this is a hint towards my, my search machines. Now, given that system, uh, this is a slide I did a couple of years ago at Dan Stahl at a future research communication workshop. And it's no longer future. This is absolutely what's happening now. So I've got workflows running that are doing analysis of, of musical content. I don't have to press the button. When the new data arrives, that button gets pressed by the computer. It's really quite good at pressing buttons. <laughs> so, that, so that's fine. So these things get rerun automatically. Um, workflows actually fail quite often, not because they decay, not because they have bit rot, but because the world changes around them. So as with any piece of software, if you wait one day, you'll get some results. You don't know if 10 nanoseconds or 10 years later, you can get the same numbers, because many things have changed. Um, we're getting better at human curation, but also automatic testing and curation of these things. We even, uh, uh, colleagues in Manchester have published papers on self-repair. Um, so actually, even if I don't get involved, I can let the computer get on doing the research. This raises a whole set of interesting ethical and uh, IP issues. Um, yeah, we, we run this repository called My Experiment, which has got a couple of thousand workflows on it. There's no reason why computers can't be running those things automatically, or even evolving those things in order to do research. Uh, we already see people choosing other, other workflows around them. We have computers choosing other workflows around them. Who owns the results? Who's liable for the damage that occurs when someone uses the results? So the ethics the responsible innovation aspects around this automation are quite, quite provocative. But the moral of this story is, having been quite user-centric so far, um, this, this is machines are users too. So as we think about research today, as we think about research tomorrow especially, um, we have to think about the machines making use of this as, as well as the humans. Um, so that, that's uh, so something I found myself talking quite a lot about uh, in the future of research communication area. So all that suggests challenges to papers. Why is it that papers are still working as well as they are? I think it's because they are dealing with the human piece of this as well as they do. So I, I, I'm not convinced that the unit of knowledge that is a paper is, is still the appropriate uh, unit of knowledge or the paper is the appropriate representation of that. But the, the fact that we we share and read uh, these things, the fact that we form social networks by, by discussing them, the fact that they act as proxies for our intellectual endeavors, that they're cited, that, that all, all that part of our, our, our social context of, of industrial research comes out of the fact that these are objects that we're passing around. And if you just look at what computers are doing with data, I think if it is data, like this huge mass of soup of, of data, that isn't a set of objects, that's just a mass of stuff. And I think this is sort of interplay between what is an object with an identifier that you can cite and, and measure my research performance by giving my university money, which is how it works in the UK, is a really, really important concept. So I just want to look at what these objects might be if they're not papers, um, and thus a glimpse perhaps of the future of, of papers. So these are the things that are passed around in that network we saw earlier, the sense making network, one on the right. <laughs> um, it might be papers, but it might also be the data. It might be statistical models. It might be narratives. It's interesting to differentiate paper and narrative because you could have multiple narratives for different audiences about the same piece of research. So I'm really focusing now on that piece on the right side of that. And it does feel sometimes today as if data has just been discovered. I'm not sure that's true for, for everyone here in the UK. It really feels like this because institutions now have to have research data management policies. And suddenly, everyone's focused on the data. It's like, no, actually, we've been doing this for some time. And it's a pity that they're focused on data and not what people are doing with it. It's a pity they're focused on data and not on software, um, which is something we're trying to do something about. But really, I want to be equally focused on, on what we do with it, on, on the methods, not just on the sharing of data, but on the sharing of the methods. If we're going to tackle that big data challenge, that deluge we saw earlier on, 
Um, okay, we can we can share data. Isn't that going to make it worse? Um, but if there's a deluge of data of people doing something with it, there's a deluge of methods as well, uh, and sharing both so that gives us uh, a handle onto onto the scale and the challenges that we need to to address the, the new research. So I really want to be just as focused on the data research, data and methods. And that's why the workflow is an interesting example, because the workflow is a, a, a bit of method. And we can share them as digital artifacts, but they're, they're like software, they're like scripts. They're just these things that help you process the data, and, then, and, and they're reusable. And, they're, and they are, in some senses, data. But it's really getting to that next level that I'm interested in. So one perspective we could take on our knowledge infrastructure then, and this is, this is a slide from observatory talks, um, is that there's all that data out there. Um, if we can create this descriptive layer in this diagram, I suppose the Google knowledge graph has a nice example of something like this. Um, that helps us do that resource discovery piece. It helps us do the, the reuse piece. But then this other layer is the thing I'm arguing for as well. The, the humans are then not just exchanging URIs, pointing at things down below there, but they're actually exchanging some sort of knowledge objects which are capturing what people are doing with things. Lots of different kinds of artifacts, lots of different kinds of people. And like in my funder example earlier, if through using these things we're adding value, then we're adding value to that whole ecosystem. So some notions of annotation uh, through use is, is adding value. So from a sort of linked data perspective, this is the kind of picture I'm interested in. Those objects then um, are, are the really important concept. They're like the papers. There's something odd going on here about whether they contain data or whether they point at data. This is an interesting balance. I call it the, the web of particle duality, like the wave particle duality. Because on the one hand, you want them to be single objects, <laughs> pretending to be an encapsulation of all this stuff. On the, on the other hand, the point is that there's the stuff, including other objects. So there is that duality that, that, that underlies this. Uh, and for the purpose of this discussion, for many of you here, because um, this is a completely extremely good metadata, you can think of them as metadata bundles. There are times when you want to turn those into a zip file instead. But on the whole, think of them as, as manifests. Think of them as metadata that describes your stuff down the way. So this my experiment thing led to an interesting experiment, social experiment. We created my experiment in order to share those workflows, like the Binky one we saw earlier. Um, the workflow was the social object. So it went two terms. The social object is the thing that your site's really good at. Books on Amazon, <laughs> uh, photos on Flickr, movies on YouTube, slides on SlideShare. Um, and, and work for some experiment. As soon as we made the, the site available in 2007, the first feature requests we had were, can people tap other things, attach other things to their workplace? Because they wanted to share PDFs and papers, they wanted to share bits of data, they wanted to share PowerPoint slides. And we could have done that with an attachment sort of model, but we didn't. We went for a slightly more generic um, approach where we didn't prescribe how people would use this, and we, we let it evolve. And um, we just gave people the notion of packs. You could just bundle some stuff together and refer to it as one item for the purposes of sharing. It has one URI. Um, and that's our prototypical research object, which I'll talk about uh, some more. But it's, um, it's an interesting experiment, because we didn't tell people what to put in these packs. And since 2007, you know, quite a few of these have been created. We've been able to go back and do an analysis of those and see what it is that people are sharing. So in a sense, this is uh, an investigation into the future of the paper, because it's what is the digital artifact, the bundle that people want to share that you can drop into the tooling of digital research. Um, so interesting, interesting experiment. And, and uh, one of the things we've reflected on, uh, and this turned into kind of a word game at the beginning of our, is what are the behaviors, what are the characteristics of these different paths that have been created? And here's some of them. Um, there's actually, we've got up to many, many more than this, and there's no definitive list or best set. But here's some examples. So these things should be um, uh, reusable uh, as part of the sharing. Uh, they should be repurposable, so if they're self subscribing people can see inside and use bits of them as they, uh, as they do their research. Sometimes we want to repeat these things, maybe the computer can repeat these things, maybe other people can repeat them um, very fast, very often, at least instantaneously, or uh, sometime in the future. Reproducibility, carefully phrased around the thing I said earlier. So a third party can do some independent reconstruction of the code where some things, uh, 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 some circumstances are different, so we can see if a prior result can be confirmed. They might need to be replayable because things happen very fast and very slowly. But you also need to be able to cite them. 
you, uh, you need to be able to uh, look at the validity of an auditing. They need to be uh, showing um, provenance and uh, attribution credit to, to others as well. That's seven out of about 40 or so R words. There are many more to be found around the press presentations and blogs. Uh, but it's, it's really this, this aspect of reflecting on what it is that people are sharing and why they're doing that. And then over the last couple of years, uh, we were very uh, fortunate to have a great team of people come together in a project called Workflow Forever to take forward that idea of what was a microscope pack that we now call research objects and actually come up with a way to represent these things. They're using um, uh, object we use in Exchange, for example. That was the, the export format for microscope in the first place. I'm not going to go into this in great detail because there's actually a workshop this afternoon. Um, called DPRMA, where we'll have um, much more discussion about exactly these things. Uh, in that workshop this afternoon, I'm going to talk about this, this, this sort of next stage of them. So, so far we've seen that in my experiment we went from workflows to bundles of stuff, we call packs, which have now generalized to research objects and we have specifications for these. Uh, and my next step plays into exactly what I was talking about for the future of research which is that these things are getting run by computers as well as by humans. So I'm referring to them as computational research objects, I'm talking about the computational models, there's computer science coming in there. Um, and actually, in some sense, that goes back to where we were in the first place with the workflows. And stuff. Uh, that's the kind of, um, you know, where I'm interested in going next with the social objects is what are those social objects for which the machines are users too, as we saw previously. So if you're interested in more on that, uh, there's a session this afternoon called DPRMA, Digital Preservation of Research Methods and Artifacts, with artifacts spelled in the great British one. Uh, and come along, we've got some great papers there which are available for people to look at. For more on the whole research object thing, um, we've, we've published papers and, and standards over the last few years. Um, this is a great paper called Why Link Data is Not Enough Scientists. I, I, um, I gave it that title to be provocative, and it really works. And what happens is that the link data community got very upset because uh, they thought I was saying um, that you know, link data wasn't suitable for science. If you actually read the paper, <laughs> it says, why link data is not enough for scientists, and the answer is more link data. So it's actually a good thing uh, for link data people. Um, but the point was, the thing we know very well, um, so, uh, so some link data people were making the assumption that if you just drop scientific data into a link data, then that magic happens, new science happens. And, and that really, there's much more to it than that. Understanding the context, being able to interpret it, doing provenance, all the things that this community is really, really good at, um, are essential as well. And that, that, that was the purpose of that paper. Then we have the standards uh, to describe the research objects that have come out. We now have a research object uh, website, which you can go to the kind of information about all these things, including the whole history of the So I think, I think that we need social objects, and that papers were those, and what we can imagine is research objects that we're sharing instead. They may be serializable as papers or other forms of documentation. Um, they drop into the tooling of research and they're used by computers as well. And finally, coming on to the thing that this, this talks about, the thing that I suggested you already know, but we haven't called it this before. It's this notion of social machines. And I think that combination of the social objects and the social machines in our scholarly ecosystem is, is what's in that fourth quadrant. So in that fourth quadrant, if we drill down and look at the research that's been going on, um, I mean, some research is studying scholarship. And I've described that as kind of on it. But some research is uh, actually getting, in, getting involved with, with what's going on in that quadrant and how you design and build things in that, in, in, up there. And I describe that as it. Right? So both important things are happening. Um, so here's some of the, the terms you've already have heard of. Crowdsourcing our views, social computing, collective intelligence, human computation, open innovation, wisdom, and are familiar terms which all apply to that place where lots of computers are coming together with lots of machines. That, that fourth quadrant is where we're generating a thing of deluge because our society is, is so well instrumented we've become sensors as well with all these devices. It's also where the analytics occur um, because, for example, we're using the crowdsourcing. Um, and it's, I think, also where we're designing systems. The term social machines comes from Tim Berners Lee. It goes back a bit, 1999. And this is quite an important phrase. Computers can help if we use them to create abstract social machines on the web. Processes in which the people do the creative work and the machine does the administration. So that goes back to my earlier point. This is about assistance, not about replacement. 
the stage is set for the evolution and growth of new social agents. And if you remember, in and there are all kinds of things out there that we put like social machines. Now, I don't want to try to define a social machine or the different categories of social machines. There are papers and presentations that do that. There are debates about what is a social machine. They go on for hours and hours in bars all over the place. Uh, so it's better for me to give some examples. Uh, the debate isn't what is a social machine, the debate is what isn't a social machine. So here are some examples. We have um, up top left, recapture, great example. Because uh, this is, uh, on the one hand, testing to see whether you're a human, on the other, helping transcribe some, some, some digitalization. Uh, this is dual purpose social machine. Wikipedia, classic social machine. This, this is a, an online community where the behavior of that machine, the behavior of that community, has evolved within the community. It wasn't programmed in on day one, we stuck with that. Um, the whole process <laughs> of the editing, um, the, the, all, all, all the, um, the flows and the control that go with Wikipedia have been created socially. Uh, over that platform. Um, more explicitly, uh, Mechanical Turk, you absolutely described how you want people to behave and how they get paid for doing so. The university talks about um, uh, what's the story about Twitter. Is that a social machine or is it a common infrastructure on which we build multiple social machines? Perhaps every hashtag is a social machine. But again, the behaviors, the <coughs> protocols around the execution of this machine have been socially constituted. Lots of great examples. Um, Hub Zero is an interesting one because the last time I was in Indianapolis was the Hub Up event last year. Uh, which is a, a fantastic example where work from the e-science and cyber infrastructure world has come together with successfully with large numbers of people. Um, uh, my experiment, we've mentioned the things in health, the things in crime, uh, movement, <coughs> all these areas where large numbers of people are coming together and the behavior of the system, yeah, it, it, it ain't a Turing machine. That's one definition. There's a great soundbite from Wendy Hall. Um, uh, uh, Turing machines are to computer science as social machines are to websites. You can debate that one as well, but it captures this idea that this, that this is, this is uh, definitely something that involves people and behaviors in other people. So, great quick two anecdotes. My experiment we've mentioned, we can argue about whether it's a social machine. Actually, the curation behaviors of being versions on there, I think it is. Uh, and this thing happened. So, 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 my experiment a year ago. When you create an account, it's protected by the social machine that is recaptured. It was nice that we had a mention in Nature, um, my data, your data, great article in Nature. At that moment, either as a consequence or just the unfortunate timing, we had a massive attack of spam accounts on my experiment. Um, and it was okay, it's still working. It's, it's odd things happen. You search for something, you find vacuum cleaners. Because what was happening is people were actually um, uh, creating accounts with links to various products. So we did what you do. We had a look at the web polls. We worked out who's creating these accounts, what's going on. And what you discover is you're being attacked by another social machine. People are being paid to block. This is part of the ecosystem of, uh, of, of Google and advertising and so on. Um, and then, of course, there's a response to that within the community as well, which is you have blacklisting sites. Here's one stop from spam, where the IP addresses and, and the email addresses of the, the, the spammers are being uh, recorded. Um, so what we did was created a quick social machine. <laughs> we made seven people into administrators. We had a Skype chat channel. We had someone writing scripts. And we eliminated the, uh, the spam accounts by making use of this site. And then we changed my experiment so that it also used the stop from spam account. So in other words, the my experiment social machine protected by the recapture social machine was attacked by the spam social machine. So we built a temporary social machine to delete accounts using people scripts. And blacklisting social machine then involved my experiment in a new social machine. <laughs> so that's. Exactly the thinking. I think we're all doing this all the time. We don't normally use those words. If you listen to people sitting discussing what they're about to do um, in their research project, they're often saying, we're going to take this website, we're going to do this, or we're going to take this content here, we're going to build this API. <laughs> Looking around the poses last night, great examples of doing exactly that. So it is, um, yeah, it's a way of describing, I think, what we already do. Um, but what is a successful social machine today? Whether it's, it's Facebook or Amazon or whatever, uh, those things have emerged within within the ecosystem. Wouldn't it be good if we could figure out how you design and construct this? What are the principles for designing a social machine? If I want to do an intervention in a social machine ecosystem and cause behaviors to change in a certain way, how do I design that machine? So by thinking about these things as first class citizens, we can think about how to design them. The in it as well as studying them, which is which is our mission. So that might experiment one. How many social machines were there? Um, so recapture my experiment, maybe that's a social machine. There's that whole 
uh, mercenary community trying to sell factories to us. Um, the whole thing might be a social machine. Uh, how do you observe these social machines? Well, um, you could look at the web logs, but actually, like I said with Zooniverse, you actually need to look at qualitative studies as well. So you end up with these mixed methods approaches, which we're seeing applied now in, 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 in analyzing this. Interesting result from early work over there is, uh, is sort of the notion of trajectories where many of the social machines have more than one purpose. We capture has two purposes for a start. And it's actually figuring out not just what are the social machines, but what are the different purposes that, that occur. I'll give you another, another quick anecdote before I close, which also comes out of that sort of social machine study. This is about Christmas. Last Christmas, I have a Christmas tree at home. It has lights on it. LEDs. There it is. Uh, I can give you all the strange insights of my family now. I, my, my, my daughter is a computer science student at the University of Bath. Uh, I found a Christmas present I gave her a raspberry pie, as one does, uh, uh, which is a device you could use to control the lights. So she, she created a Twitter bot, so you could tweet at the Christmas tree and change the lights. Um, <laughs> fine, we did that useful exercise at home over Christmas. Left it running. Next day, uh, I, uh, we, we noticed that our, our Twitter account for the tree, Lost Tree Pie, had a friend. Oh, that's good. That's interesting. I wonder, I wonder who that was. Where did that come from? So you, you look at this, this new friend. And it was, it was someone apparently tweeting proverbs. Now, this is actually quite interesting because it has interesting effects on the lights. And that was interesting. <laughs> Serendipitous um, uh, piece of, uh, of, uh, of uh, experiment. Uh, but uh, actually, of course, this, this other account that was following was also a bot. And this takes us into interesting, and there it is, last few pie, and, and, and this bot was actually, in its profile, linked to a, um, a hookup. <laughs> so it's kind of, which is a social machine. <laughs> uh, so, so on the one hand, we can look at this as social machine thing, but there's something else going on here, which is what's human and what isn't. Um, and, and the recapture things about that as well. And this is a big issue in Twitter. Uh, there's another, there's, this is a reference to a site called Bot or Not, because you try to figure out what's human and what isn't. My point is, with the increasing automation, this becomes an increasing problem. So the web scientists who, and, and, and social machines observers who want to analyze web logs uh, or, uh, to understand how people are interacting with the web, it's going to be increasingly hard because they're not all people anymore. And the web is adapting all the time to how people are interacting with it. What, what someone sees when they follow a link, what price they see when they look at a product, is a result of them and their history. Uh, so, you know, it's an increasingly automated system. Observing humans is increasingly harder. So there's a whole, there's a whole sort of underlying issue there, the challenges of the automation. And also, the, the, it's a social machine. Twitter has rules about bots. It has a whole set of things. Um, the fact that the, our, our account still exists and the other one's gone is probably uh, possibly a result of people having reported it, or possibly a result of um, it automatically it's been detected that it was tweeting repetitive Strings of text which were the same uh, over, over a period of time. So there's a so it's a Twitter of observing social machines and reacting to them. So we are all doing social machines. And finally, <coughs> scholarly machines ecosystem. Uh, <coughs> the talk. This is a lovely sort of cartoon that was drawn during the Beyond the PDF event by a startup group, uh, and and it captures lots of things that we discussed there. Because I, I sit at events like that and like this, I I, I play spot the social machine and never. Awful lot of social machines. All, all these new websites that have been created, the new startups, forming different bits of the scholarly communication and publishing uh, ecosystem as, as libraries, as publishers unbundle what they do and they can't do it in different ways. Lots of social machines, you know, websites for doing peer review, that's a social machine. Um, so, just sort of mapping that then to the earlier examples I gave of how research is done. This is me in the music information retrieval world using uh, a set of things which we could, we could look at from a social machine as a context. So, is that oh, kind of good people are uploading this stuff, analyzing music from there. Actually, the results of the Salami Grand Truth are sitting in a social machine called Fixture. The workflows I'm using come from my experiment. I write papers. I use the EasyShare conference system to, when I submit them, I also put my preprints in, in eprints. I give talks and conferences like this on SlideShare. This talk is on SlideShare. I blog on Silox. Um, my software uh, is, is uh, um, potentially, I haven't uploaded it yet. <laughs> Uh, one of many, many code repositories. There's a nice one for, for music in the UK called Sound Software, which is a great name for the site. 
Um, I had trouble when I'm coding. I might go to the searching machine and stack over for the expertise to help me. Other people might read my papers in the ACM Digital Library and refer to the momentum and so on. So we are all engaged with social machines all the time, as academics and particularly uh, in this community. And I suggest to you that many of you are designers of these things on social machines. And that's what's really interesting. We just, we just started a five-year project four years ago. Uh, I'm really focused on how it is that we build these things. And I'm rethinking computer science. So it isn't bottom left, it's top right, so it's fourth quadrant. Uh, that's half. So that's really computer science. So the fundamental notion is that the computer is the combination of computers and humans. So this is that definition which is familiar to probably everyone here of uh, of the uh, definition of digital library management and information security services. Yeah. My suggestion to you is, is that we can see that as an early definition of a social machine, if you like, but everyone is working in this space. Particularly if you take the perspectives in these in this row of books here, digital libraries, digital library use. The, one, the third one there is from um, the Knowledge Infrastructure Workshop, which was last year run by Paul Edwards. It really takes this knowledge infrastructure Approach. I think the social machines approach is very much that. This social and technical systems approach is exactly what we do. So, not only do I hope this is useful to you to have this notion of social machines, and to realize that's perhaps what you're doing, but I think that you have the answers to uh, everyone else who's actually also finding themselves in the fourth quadrant where the digital library community has already, already got. Two closing thoughts. Is the Memex a social machine? I'll leave you with that. I mean, it's Trails, right? That was socially constructed. Good. Here's an intriguing one. Um, in another project of Smart Society, where they're taking a lot of the science approach to the social machines thing, they're talking about how you describe the computations that are occurring that involve humans. And the example they're using is correspondence chess, where people play chess by, by, by sending postcards with their moves. So people are involved in multiple games at once, and they occur over months and months and months. Um, so this is people sending little messages and overall the computation proceeds towards an end. Actually, you could look at science like that. You could look at research like that. With communications that are occurring, all those scholarly communications, those things that were shared in, in, in all my earlier examples. So there's two little teasing thoughts to leave you with. Closing, closing two slides. First, end of the article. I think it's still necessary to just move on this ambition. How digital research is done today, yeah, new methods, automation, but the arrow is going up, more to come. I think the reason this paper, papers have lasted 350 years uh, is, is they are social objects. And, and, and they're, they're within our, our social technical system embedded in the way they are. I think that uh, we're seeing potential, not that there's any replacement, but supplements of these processes. And social machines, I think you know how to do them, which is great, very useful. We should engage with that discussion. And then these things worry me. These stop me sleeping at night, but I think they're warnings to all of us about everything I've just said. Um, with the increasing automation, there, there are some concerns. Uh, and I, I, I gave a version of this talk a couple of weeks ago to a digital humanities summer school. I spent three hours arguing about these points. So where's the critical? Hume is really good at critical thinking. Where, where's that in, in, in this new paradigm if it involves these machines so much? Have I just been guilty of data fundamentalism? I criticized the Chris Anderson article, but I didn't talk about data understanding. I just talked about data. Right? That, that understanding piece, what is the data, what does it mean, is incredibly important. That wasn't in my talk. Should I worry? Um, I haven't talked about user experience enough. I've just been user-centric, but I haven't talked about the wonderful things we can do in terms of visualization and interaction. I've assumed that the objects that humans are using are also the ones that computers want to use, but why? Maybe the computers want to use different objects. We should ask them. Is this tailorization of research? That's what Willard McCarthy says. Um, and, and the deepest point in all of this is if this is a new paradigm, and in some philosophy of science sense, if we're burning that into the automation, into those workflows, aren't we burning in uh, how we're doing research? Isn't that highly dangerous? Okay. Uh, again, critical thing. I'll close there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And um, I was happy to see you bring up social objects, um, having some, done some analysis on sort of document models and how we treat documents, and then the things we say about documents. There's a real a lot of contradictions there. And I sort of ended up in this position of thinking, oh, these must be social objects. Um, and then I was also glad to see your kind of question about object conflation there, because that's exactly the challenge I wanted to present to you. So maybe you're <laughs> saying you're, you already. But um, I think there's a real fundamental um, uh, tension between a social object and, as you say, what, what computers do, and serialization. You know, in order to make art, those, all these wonderful social machines you talked about, you kind of need serialized objects to run on your computers. So I guess um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on kind of ways to move forward in our kind of object models and our descriptive models that can let us really build in all the things you want to say from the social angles. I think many of these uh, points need be studied. <laughs> and uh, I, I really don't think they're doing that. <laughs> the, um, my, my web particle duality worries me. I should have put that on, my, on this list, actually. Um, because when you hear people talking about research objects, they flip between whether it's an encapsulated object and whether it's a lump of web. Um, and this hasn't really been discuss it. I mean, the software of the workshop, it might be, but through the workflow of project where we've come up with, with ways of representing research objects, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about that. Um, I have various colleagues in the room who may want to correct me. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm, I'm, I think it is an yeah, I think it's an absolutely fundamental point. I don't think we have the answers on it. It does need study. Um, I will, as you say, I have okay, rehearsed some of these before, and my defense for the object inflation is to reduce the scope of those objects and say it's where the humans meet the computers. If you just might dismount the stuff, but when, when, we, when we engage, we need those objects. Maybe. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Uh, I'm Alki from uh, Tokyo University. I really enjoy your talk and vision. Uh, I wonder what your uh, vision or thoughts are on the evaluation of scholarship, uh, with the uh, inversion of knowledge infrastructure, and particularly with the uh, digital research objects, how can uh, scholarly uh, productivity and impact be evaluated? Uh, just there's a very sensitive part. answer to that, which is that um, clearly in these digital systems, it's easier to instrument everything and to build in the metrics and, and so on. And I, I think that's true. I'm, and I'm sure people are aware of various visions, particularly in the science, of science policy area, where by the time your paper comes out, um, uh, funding agencies can just look at that and tell immediately who was funded by what, how much, and who gets what credit for what, because it's all within the system, from, from funders right through the admin system through the school of the what, what, One of the reasons I think you're very good at this is because you don't just build social machines, you build connected up social machines, and that's a very connected. Uh, vision, uh, which some people have. But if I say that, it's kind of saying that I think that's how scholarship should be evaluated by some numbers like that. I don't think that's true. <laughs> um, I feel this very, um, uh, as other Brits were in the room, I, I feel this uh, personally at the moment, because this October is the census date in the UK where we will be measured by our top four papers for the last few years. And the number that comes out of that score is the financial income to our institutions. So it's all down to those metrics. Um, and it's quite, yeah, so interesting how you do that. <laughs> but I think that I didn't talk much about provenance, but provenance is part of the answer to that. So I, I think we can do a lot uh, within these, uh, within the digital research ecosystem. It's about getting the right set of into operation systems to do that. And that really does need the question of thinking as well. So, we will the business you've done before. Uh, we eat, let me try to be brief here, but I want to push a little bit on um, the issue of the article and its purpose and, and uh, uh, reference and antidote here is another reason why the article is so important um, for certain kinds of things. Um, going back to a, a small group meeting um, about 10 years ago at the Office of Venture, Ed Fox may remember this, uh, he was there. Um, we also had some people from uh, American Institute of Physics and 
for the physical society, for the editorial groups. And the, the basic thrust of the meeting was publishers saying, creating demands for authors to include or link to or embed somehow their data. Um, and the, the, the phrase given to it by the publishers was the essential non-tech stuff that we have to somehow include in our articles. Um, but there was a counterpoint brought up along the way, which said, well, this is important for many articles. You know, you didn't read, or physicists didn't read Einstein because of the data, the raw data he presented. They didn't read even that much for the distillation and tables of the data. They read much more for the synthesis and the conclusion and the hypotheses put forward, which they could be tested against future data that nobody had gathered yet. And that was a role that, in your alluded to here, is a matter of being careful of data fundamentalism uh, about recommending about recognizing the importance of, of um, that contribution of critical thinking that is not distillable to the data exactly. Um, and that's an important reason. I, I, I agree strongly, and um, this is part of my frustration uh, with the new physical perception of data who want to make absolutely everything open so that you can repeat an experiment. I would actually rather you wrote down the algorithm on a piece of paper and gave it to me, and I had to recode it. Then, and then I'd be reproducing. Uh, so, um, uh, all the other stuff is useful to reconstruct and, and, and to share, and for, for so many other reasons, but it isn't to be reproduced. Um, so, that aspect of papers absolutely still needs to be there. I, I, I'm attracted, and I'm interested that within the context of European funding, we're now discussing the next big funding programs, the Horizon 2020 framework aid. And in one area, global system science, um, which has lots of complexity theorists, lots of scientists involved, they have a whole major thread through that called narratives, because they understand how important it is that the research be understood and communicated to different audiences. Um, and that's to scientists, but also to policy makers and so on. So that there's a sense there that you'd have multiple narratives around the same piece of research. And so, it's what you said to Karen, um, that boundary of innovation, where you have that commonly interpretable core, but the digital world is easy to bring in other things, uh, is, is very attractive in that context. So, from paper to boundary. The clock is running against us. We can entertain one more question. Uh, Ed, I guess you have your hand up, so you will be our ultimate uh, <laughs> question for JCDL 2013. Um, thank you so much. Wonderful talk. And uh, lots of things I'll chat with you about later. But um, since we're in a community here with lots of educators and lots of librarians and others and policymakers, um, one of the things that this reminded me of is Christine Borgman's suggestion that every graduate student, especially a doctoral student, take three or four research methods courses. So, how do we get the knowledge, the awareness, the concepts that you've been expressing into the training of new students? Um, and new scientists and new scholars, so that, that this can be widely understood and shared. I think, I think this is a great and important question. Um, I, I've been involved with websites, and we, uh, over a period of years, we've managed to build a whole web science curriculum. And I'm watching other people now build other data science curriculum. Um, I'm watching with some frustration. I, I, I recently, I won't name names, but I recently saw a, a big data master's course where they bundled together some um, computer science courses, uh, inference machine learning, natural language processing, stats. Okay. I said, this is big data. And my comments were that this, was, this isn't data science. This is data computer science without the data. Because there was nothing in there about understanding data at all. So uh, it's, it's a very important discussion. It's one we should be having. It, it relates to both web science curricula and to um, the uh, um, data science curricula. Uh, I think an information science version of that data science course would be very, very different to a computer science. So um, as a community, if we can take that discussion forward, that would be really good. Uh, um, I'm attracted by the idea of having, I mean, just done a digital humanities summer school, I'd be interested um, to, to see what, what, what sort of summer school we might run and address all these things. That's quite a concrete proposal. I'd really like to have that discussion. Um, and maybe this conference and this community uh, next year, you could do something like that. That would be fantastic. The biggest round of applause ever, please.
So we are going to have to make a quick uh, note change here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.